Okay, it looks like it's top of the hour. Thank you everyone for joining us today for our webinar. Just a couple quick things before we get started. Please use the chat function to submit any questions throughout the webinar, and we'll try to get to those at the end of the webinar. And your certificates will be available on Monday by logging into your account. Um, Diane, if you wanna go ahead and get started, go right ahead. Thanks, give me one second to pull up my slides. <clears throat> all right, great. Mm -hmm. Um I hope that you are all having a good Thursday. Um, I've had quite a uh, challenging summer and challenging past week or so, um, but I'm happy to be here today with you to talk about how we can really better support families um, prenatally and post birth by helping them to develop a breastfeeding support team. Um, this is something that I'm just really passionate about because <clears throat> I was having a conversation yesterday with one of my colleagues um, because this week is also the International Society for Research in Human Milk and Lactation Virtual Conference. And we were talking about the fact that <clears throat> I've had my PhD now for over 25 years and breastfeeding has been endorsed by the World Health Organization for over 25 years, yet we're really not doing much better than we were 25 years ago. Um, more people might be trying breastfeeding, but the breastfeeding isn't sustained. And the pandemic <clears throat> has decreased breastfeeding rates. Um, and primarily those rates have decreased in uh, low income families and people of color. So we really have to challenge ourselves to think about what we can do better to really help families. So the first thing I want to do though, um, I'm hoping I won't be emotional, is to just give a little acknowledgement. Um, Peter Hartman, died last week. Um, yesterday was his funeral. He lived to be an amazing 80 years old. I know all of you know Peter's work. <clears throat> this is my favorite picture of Peter. Um, it comes from when I studied at the University of Western Australia. So I was fortunate enough to do my first sabbatical there in 2007, and I got to spend um, a whole semester there. And um, one of the things I love about the University of Western Australia and Perth and Peter was that pretty much every week, there was a reason that we would go down to the Swan River and have some type of celebration. Um, it was always celebrating someone's birthday or someone's publication or someone's new grant or some research findings, but like pretty much every week we took the time to go down to the Swan River and celebrate. And so I love this picture of Peter because he's got the two bottles of champagne in his hands. Um, he is my hero, even though he's no longer with us. Um, this is my last picture I have with him. The last time he was able to travel was 2018 when we were in Japan. I've been working with his daughter, Melinda, on a project um, this summer, so I knew that Peter had a terminal diagnosis, um, but it didn't make it any less sad to hear about him dying. But when you think about Peter <clears throat> and what has been done at the University of Western Australia, it has changed so much 
pretty much everything, I think, about what we know about human milk and lactation. So stem cells came from the Hartman lab, the anatomy of the lactating breast, the anatomy of infant suckling, the anatomy and digestion of milk in the stomach, the use of lactation biomarkers to look at coming to volume, 24 hour milk production and storage capacity and understanding that every person who's lactating has a different capacity to synthesize and store milk in their breast. And that when we report um, expression or amount of milk, it's not enough to just talk about volume because every person's storage capacity is different. So we have to talk about percent available milk from the breast. So I know you all join me in probably sadness, but also in thanks for really the remarkable contributions that Peter has given to us. He had over 60 PhD students, but his mentorship went beyond just his PhD students. Uh, Peter has been a close mentor of mine ever since I met him. And when I got my PhD in 1995, I knew that the one and only one thing I wanted to do when I had the chance to get a sabbatical was to go and study with Peter. Um, he has remained an advisor to me and helped me and um, helped so many in their journeys and, um, you know, our world of lactation won't ever be the same without him, but his mentorship will allow his legacy to let, um, go on. And um, I am very thankful that I had all the years I had with him from 2007 till this year, because it has helped shape um, both the educator, scientist, and clinician that I am today. So thank you. So for those of us who haven't met, I always like to start off by the fact that I do have a joint appointment. I think it's really important to understand that I am not just a researcher. I'm not just an educator. I'm not just a clinician, but I actually do all of those roles on a daily basis. <clears throat> so we do have our whole semester course at the University of Pennsylvania on human milk and breastfeeding. It remains one of the only courses in the world. I have doctoral students, two currently, um, one who's looking at antenatal expression of colostrum and one who's working with African-American families who breastfeed beyond a year. My second appointment at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, I've been there for since 2001. And when I was recruited there to start the lactation program and, and everything, I really said yes to it because I care for critically ill babies, such as baby Charlotte. As you all know, human milk and breastfeeding is important for all children. For sick babies, it can be the matter of life and death and it can transform the entire family's experience. <clears throat> so what our objectives are today are for you to identify ways in which you could change your current prenatal care paradigm for families in your clinical practice, to look at current research and findings related to breastfeeding support persons and breastfeeding outcomes, and really, and I'm gonna end with that, this at the end, a call to action for you to incorporate something from today into your clinical practice. And I really would like to hear from you at the end of the presentation today, what you are going to do to change your clinical practice. <clears throat> so we first have to really think about whether or not parents receive adequate prenatal education. And this is a question that I come across every single day, every single day 
I come across this question and I'm going to give an example just from yesterday. I was at my gym doing my spinning class <clears throat> and there happens to be a shortage right now where I live of half and half and cream. And so that then caused a participant in the class to say, yes, there's also a shortage of infant formula. And my daughter's really worried because she's going to be giving birth to twins and she's going to need formula. And so I, of course, had to stop and speak with her after class. And I said, well, why does your daughter need to have formula for her twins? She can breastfeed them. And she said, well, my daughter was told there's no way she would ever be able to make enough milk for two babies, which we know is not true. Just this past week, there was a story on TikTok about a mother who expressed milk for triplets and had plenty of milk to exclusively breastfeed her triplets, but all along the way, she had negative feedback from her healthcare providers and from the hospital staff that were caring for her children that it was not possible. So if we look at the situation globally, we really have to acknowledge that the current practice paradigm isn't working. And again, this week is the International Society for Research in Human Milk and Lactation Conference. And, you know, we have so much scientific data about the milk. We know how amazing human milk is. We know how it changes health outcomes. But yet, we have not really made any strides in the past 25 years in really significantly increasing long-term breastfeeding rates. One could argue that initiation rates have gone up in the past 20 years in the US, which is true, but the duration and the exclusivity is still suboptimal and the duration and exclusivity worldwide is still optimal. And again, through the pandemic, we have seen decreases in breastfeeding rates, in particular with vulnerable populations who aren't getting access to the information that they need. So if we think just about the US context, we only have 25% getting 100% human milk diet for the first six months, which means that three out of four American children are at risk for poor health outcomes. And again, the disparity piece is alarming because we have seen this go up in the US and around the world. We have seen the variance in breastfeeding rates in terms of negative changes happen for our low income families and our people of color. We really have to address the fact that all people are not getting equal care. This is widely published in data around the world. And not only do we have differences in whether or not people make the decision to breastfeed, we then have babies who don't have access to donor milk, and we have babies or parents who don't get access to technical breastfeeding assistance and support. So if you can sit there and say to me, 100% of your people are initiating breastfeeding and continuing, then you're doing a good job. But I don't know at really any place in the US or around the world where there's a close to 100% initiation rate, all right? Because our only limitations for breastfeeding in the US 
are HIV positive, active illegal drug use, um, and sometimes temporary medication things. So we should be doing better than we are. And we see this impact of our people of color not breastfeeding affect the health outcomes of their children and also impact death. <clears throat> Again, we see that people choose formula because that's what they've seen in their community. That's what they've seen in their family. And we've got to stop making assumptions that people are not interested in breastfeeding. If we don't give them the right information, they're not going to have the opportunity to be interested in breastfeeding. We need to help families think about how human milk and breastfeeding would work for their lifestyle. And I have an example about this that happened recently. And again, it's why I want you to really think about your current paradigm. I have an acquaintance that I know who had her first child. She was very informed about breastfeeding and she was a personal trainer. So she was very interested in health. She did not have an ideal birth experience, and she had many challenges with conflicting information at the birth of her child, including a presumed tongue tie. And she was growing very, very frustrated with getting lots of different mixed messages from her health providers. So she reached out to me because she knew what I did. And she said, will you just talk to me? And so I spent about 20 minutes on the phone talking to her. And, you know, she had expressed that at this point in time, she was primarily pumping and feeding the baby express milk. And I, and so I asked her about that decision and why she did it and what was going on. And she said it was mostly because of her frustration and the fact that she got a lot of conflicting information about her son, her the tongue tie, et cetera. And so, and she said she felt frustrated because she was working with a lactation person who told her, well, you have to get the baby to breast. You have to get the baby to breast. That's what you have to do. And so I had a conversation with her about the fact that express milk is different than when we're feeding directly at the breast. And I talked about some of Megan Azad's work. And I said to her, yes, it is true that directly breastfeeding at the breast is going to be the best in terms of microbiota and the milk. But if that's not working for you and your lifestyle, then I would rather see you be a pump dependent mom and get the highest quality pump you can and build a robust milk supply and be a pump dependent mom and ensure that your baby gets 100% human milk diet. And when I said that to her at that point, she started crying. And I said, um, I didn't mean to make you cry. I'm really sorry. And she said, Diane, you're the first person who's listened to me. This is the first time that anyone has ever said to me that it is okay that I can be a pump dependent mom and that I can make this work for my lifestyle. And so after that initial conversation, she got herself a better quality pump. She ended up being a pump dependent mom. She got a, a liter of milk a day. She still had a little bit of challenges. I referred her to a colleague of mine, a former student who's a midwife in IDCLC, and that person reinforced how great of a job she's doing. And so, again, when we think about how we approach this prenatally, if we don't give people the right information about why human milk is so important, 
The default is always going to be to quit and not breastfeed. And then once they give birth, we also have to listen to them. We have to listen to them and we have to help them figure out how human milk and breastfeeding is going to work for their particular lifestyle. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with my model. I'm not going to go into detail except for talking about informed decision making because I really want you to think really hard about whether or not you are truly speaking to all of the families you care for and giving all the families you care for the same information that's based on science. That's informed decision-making. So in most of prenatal care, we see the first thing that happens is that at that first visit, there's a box to check and it's whether or not someone's gonna breastfeed or formula feed. And maybe someone says breastfeeding is good and you should do it. But oftentimes if people want further information on breastfeeding, they have to sign up for a separate class that they either attend, have to attend virtually or they have to go to on their own personal time. They might have to pay money for it, okay? Um, it might not be accessible or easy for them to take that separate class. Or maybe someone just looks at them and based on their skin color, their income, or some other reasons, they make an assumption that that person isn't interested in it. So at every single visit, okay, every single visit, and this can be while we're measuring the fundus and listening to the heart tones, Tell me what you've heard about breastfeeding and human milk. What are your concerns? At, you know, I, at 12 o'clock today, was doing a lunch and learn for the University of Pennsylvania. And the number one concern brought up, breastfeeding's gonna hurt. I heard that breastfeeding is painful and my nipples are gonna bleed, okay? Well, if you just start going off on a person about how great breastfeeding is, and you're not addressing her concern about pain and bleeding, she's not going to hear any of it because she's not going to want to breastfeed because she thinks her nipples are going to fall off. So we first have to understand what they've known and what they've heard and what their concerns are. And then after we hear their concerns and address their concerns, we want to share the science and we want to help them come up with a plan to make human milk and breastfeeding work for their family and their lifestyle. I do think it's really critical to focus on the science. And we have so much data and so much science, but it's not out there in the lay literature and it's not being talked about to families from a science-based approach. And so talking to them about how human milk impacts every single organ and that it impacts the child, not just short term, but also long term. So it's a dose dependent relationship that we want parents to learn about and understand that it's better for the baby to get some human milk versus no human milk, but that it is dose dependent. So the longer and more exclusive, we're gonna have better outcomes. And I think that's really critical because if you look at our breastfeeding rates globally at 41% exclusive in the first six months and 25% in the US for the first six months, again, our children of our society are not having optimal health and developmental outcomes because they're not getting that dose response. Again, the science is so critical, and this is, again, illustrated by the fact that people don't get appropriate information about the science of human milk. And I'm going to give you a case exemplar of this right now. 
I had a very well educated woman who was trying to understand um, what milk she should feed to her baby. She was told that it was really important to pump and have a freezer stash. And so she had this big freezer stash of milk when she went back to work. And so what she was doing was she was taking milk that she pumped the day before, putting it in the freezer and taking out old milk and feeding that milk to her child. And so I explained to her while that frozen milk was not bad, it certainly wasn't going to be as potent and as important for her child as the milk that she pumped the day before. Because when we freeze milk, we destroy the white blood cells. We destroy the stem cells. The antibodies are reduced in their effectiveness as is the lactoferrin. And so parents need to understand that there are ingredients in human milk that are not ever gonna be an infant formula. And they also need to understand that those ingredients in milk may look different be depending on whether or not the milk came directly from the source at the breast, if it was frozen, or if it was pasteurized. Some hospitals have reported to me that when they've introduced pasteurized donor human milk in their units, that their breastfeeding rates have gone down. Because the parents like, oh, well, why do I need to do all that work of pumping if my baby can get pasteurized donor human milk and turn out just as good? And we don't have any evidence at all to support that pasteurized donor human milk is as good as fresh milk. It just happens to be better than the alternative infant formula. So we need to teach parents these nuances so they know how to manage their lactation journey and ensure that their baby gets the best quality milk possible. Again, reinforcing the current science um, regarding the robust antibody response for parents who've been exposed to COVID helping people understand that this is a daily living changing thing that the mother is doing, the lactating parent is doing when they're making milk for their child. Now, again, a lot of times in prenatal care, information is only being given to the pregnant person. And we've known for a really long time that we can't just give information to the pregnant person. We need to be targeting that family. The Surgeon General called to action over a decade ago, talks about the need to target grandparents and to target fathers. So we need to be giving this information to the whole family. We need to set up a breastfeeding support network with that family prior to birth. Now remember, if the person is the first generation lactating person in her family, that might be really tough because there might not be a lot of family members who are gonna be bought into that journey, which means we're gonna have to look for a support network outside of the immediate family. And something really important, and I don't think that's talked enough, enough about with families, is setting up a contingency plan. What are you gonna do if you have a baby who comes early? What are you gonna do if you have a baby who doesn't latch on effectively? Who's gonna help you care for your other children? How are you gonna access a breast pump if your baby can't feed effectively? What type of pump should you have if you end up being pump dependent? So thinking about what your contingency plan is gonna be 
before you get burned, okay, before you get into the situation where we're not having the ideal breastfeeding experience or ideal outcome. So does it work to have a science-based approach? At CHOP, we do a model with our sick um, babies, prenatally diagnosed fetal anomalies, where we provide group prenatal care or the centering model. Not all of our families come to us with prenatal intent. Um, we have some who are totally anti-human milk and breastfeeding because They've never been taught anything about it. But as part of our centering model, the parents meet and they learn again about that science based approach to lactation and their lactation journey. And not only does this pet impact initiation with a 100% initiation rate, but it also led to long term provision of human milk. So all of these children were sick, required care in an intensive care unit or a cardiac intensive care unit. And the majority, 87%, went home on human milk and breastfeeding. That's very different than national data on human milk at discharge, which still shows only about a 50% average at discharge, okay? So again, thinking about the power of the approach. So we have a current um, study that has been finished that is under review, which looked at a tailored prenatal lactation intervention. This is a one-on-one -on -one intervention with a family. It includes a comprehensive prenatal risk assessment for lactation risk factors, as well as teaching the parents about potential risks and how to proactively manage milk supply, teaching that science of human milk and the physiology of lactation, showing them lactation equipment prior to birth, knowing that we want to have a contingency plan if something doesn't go as expected. Having significant involvement of the family members and understanding the need for a sense of urgency about milk supply. So we think about this. We want someone to be able to come to full volume by day five after birth. You think about the research again from the Hartman group. By day five, we should be making about 500 mLs a day. Whether we're a pump dependent person or whether we are breastfeeding directly at the breast, we have a critical window to establish lactation biomarkers and to establish volume. So we want to have parents understand that critical window before birth so that they can proactively manage milk supply, mitigate risk, and have a contingency plan if needed. So this is the outcomes, and this is confidential data, so I ask you not to share this at all, um, the manuscripts under review that looked at the results of that targeted intervention. And you can see that the rates of breastfeeding are statistically significantly higher at all time points with 50% breastfeeding at a year and actually not on the slide, one third breastfeeding beyond per year. So in closing during the prenatal time, we also want to think about goals versus success, okay? I have to say the language of the 10 steps for successful breastfeeding from WHO, I don't like that language because I don't know what success means. And my definition of success could be very different than yours. We know that when parents have goals, they're more likely to achieve those goals. And this was a study from a NICU in Connecticut, and they found that the biggest predictor of breastfeeding at discharge 
It wasn't income. It wasn't race. It wasn't any of that. It was that the person actually had a goal. That's what led to the baby being breastfeeding at discharge. And then we have to think about how we're talking about breastfeeding, right? And while I would love it if every person had a birth experience where the baby came out, it was a vaginal delivery, no complications. The baby is immediately skin to skin. It attaches and it's pure bliss. Um, that is not most people I know giving birth. Most people have interventional deliveries. They have Pitocin, they have epidurals, they have things that create risk. And so talking to parents about the fact that it is a commitment, that it is hard work, that they might have challenges, but we are going to help them work through their challenges and keep them breastfeeding. So what research exists on breastfeeding support teams? And is it all high quality research? And what should we do with that research in our clinical practice? So I'm first gonna start with doulas. So doulas, are known to improve birth outcomes. There's actually extensive amount of research that shows when doulas are utilized, we have less interventions done during labor, which leads to less interventional births. So in theory, this should improve the early initiation of skin to skin and breastfeeding, okay? And again, think about how people give birth. We have few people who have access or utilize doulas or even know what a doula is. And we only have about 5% of the population who gives birth with midwives. So most everyone you're gonna care for is going to have a very interventional labor and birth. So, if we know doulas improve birth outcomes, what do they do for breastfeeding outcomes? So this is a new publication. It was just released this year, and it is an integrated review about doulas impact on breastfeeding initiation and duration. So if any of you ever took a research methods class, you know that the highest level of evidence is at the top of the pyramid. So that's your systematic review or your integrated review. The difference between a systematic review and an integrated review is your systematic review only includes quantitative studies. Your integrated review includes both qualitative and quantitative research. So what we know about doulas okay, is that they do impact breastfeeding initiation. There is a positive correlation, positive outcomes that if someone has access to doula services, initiation is much better. The duration is not very clear. And part of that is the short amount of time that people may have exposure to doulas. The other thing that's very important to note about the literature of doulas in terms of breastfeeding outcomes is that they are particularly impactful in at-risk communities. So our low-income families, our families of color. So in the US, as I mentioned, only 6% of United States families use doula services. I do find it encouraging though, that this is now coming into the mainstream literature. And here is a New York Times article. This article was published in April of 2020. Um, and it really goes through what a doula is and whether or not you need one, okay? so. We're now starting to talk about this a little bit more in mainstream media. 
but how do we create access, okay? At the University of Pennsylvania, the Philadelphia Alliance for Labor Support started about 25 years ago as a student group at Penn. So at the University of Pennsylvania, um, we have BSN, MSN, PhD. We have a large midwifery program. We had students who were very interested in labor support. And this first started as a University of Pennsylvania club funded from the university. And then it grew into a community based um, group that still has extensive support from Penn. But one of the real goals of PALS is to increase access to doula service, especially for at risk families. So if you are low income and you can't afford to pay for doula services, you can get a doula for no charge. And again, when we think about access, doulas aren't something that are covered by most insurances. There are some places like Minnesota where you can actually get coverage um, for doulas or low income people. But think about your own community and how could you access or increase access to doulas in your own community that you serve? What about peer counselors? Now, if you look at the literature and the Cochrane, Okay, the Cochrane Review says that there's low quality evidence for the use of peer to peer support. It doesn't say no evidence, it just says it's low quality. It means that there's not enough research studies done at this point in time. I want to particularly share this study <coughs> with my colleagues from Tampa General Hospital and the University of South Florida. Because again, where we see the impact with many of these interventions of breastfeeding support people is with our most vulnerable communities. And in this research study, we provided education to families who were in high risk prenatal clinics. They were all low income families, primarily of color. And we really wanted them to understand the impact of their high risk pregnancy and any medication on lactation. And in fact, that they could breastfeed their child. So when we did this intervention, we found that we were able to increase breastfeeding knowledge infant feeding and tension for breastfeeding and breastfeeding initi initiation. And as you can see that this group of people would be considered very high risk for not choosing breastfeeding in the US, for not initiating and not con continuing. So again, introducing that breastfeeding support team prior to birth can make a big difference. What about peer counselors and WIC? I would be interested to hear what has happened in your local communities because during the pandemic, most in-person peer counseling evaporated, right? It all went away. Um, and so when we think about that impact in vulnerable communities, being able to continue to breastfeed. That's worrisome. We also know that when we look at federal funding for the WIC program, WIC spends 25 times as much money on the purchase of infant formula as they do on their peer counselor budget, right? So there's a discord there between formula and peer to peer support, which we know can make an impact on vulnerable families. We can seek peer to peer support 
from all different types of organization. La Leche, right, being kind of the people who started peer-to-peer -peer support, local community groups that I've seen organized in churches, community centers, nursing mothers groups, okay? Now, again, I want you to think about your own clinical practice and what has happened with COVID and where you're going in this continuing COVID world. Is everything just online? Or are you having any in-person peer-to-peer support, all right? And when we did some research early in the pandemic um, with first-time moms in Philadelphia about um, the impact on birth and breastfeeding, the women we interviewed said, you know, online can be so good for some things, answering questions, but it doesn't replace someone helping me latch my baby to the breast. And if I need help latching my baby to the breast, I need tangible in-person support. Another thing I'd like you to consider is gender inclusive versus non-inclusive groups. Many peer-to-peer -peer groups are mothers only, okay? And if you are of the male gender, you are not welcome. I've actually had challenges in my class I teach at Penn with support groups saying that my male nursing student was not allowed to attend the peer support group because it was a woman's only group. So I think that's interesting to think about. I understand the concept of giving safe space for women um, but also I think about the fact that a woman doesn't breastfeed in isolation. And so thinking about whether we should have gender inclusive versus gender non-inclusive groups and welcoming all family members. I also think we have to acknowledge that the peer-to-peer -peer support might not be appropriate for hospitalized infants because the issues that hospitalized infants face are very different than a mother or a parent who's at home feeding a healthy child. So we have published quite some time ago about our GEMS group, which was started by a nurse in our NICU. She had, was co-chair of the breastfeeding committee at the time. Our group is inclusive of all family members. Um, so it is not just the lactating parent, but grandmom, sister, brother, whoever is welcome. Um, we did have to go to a virtual format for some time with COVID. Our focus though is empowerment on that whole family, not just the lactating parent. Home visits make a difference. Okay, so the nurse family partnership. Nurse family partnership, unfortunately, is not available universally, right? It would be great if it was universal, but it's only for low income women who are pregnant with their first child. We know that NFP increases breastfeeding rates, but not all people have equal access. Which brings me to home visits. So, Long, long time ago, early in my career, we did look at a nurse and peer counselor model for home visiting. And when we looked at that model, the subjects were enrolled in the hospital setting and they got just four home visits, just four home visits. And that statistically significantly increased breastfeeding rates at six and 12 weeks post birth in a population of low-income African-American families. Now, I want you again to think about your own clinical practice. How many of your parents take advantage of a home visit or get a home visit covered by their insurance? When I meet with every single family that I meet before birth, I ask them, if they have talked to their insurance about getting a lactation visit post birth, how many parents do you think have done that research? The answer is pretty much zero, okay? So the parent has to be proactive, 
in contacting their insurance, finding how many home visits are covered, and if so, with what type of provider. I have seen some insurance co companies cover up to five home visits, but that's certainly not standard of care, such as in Australia, my favorite country, where the new family gets five standard home visits from the nurse midwife. So when we think about that breastfeeding support team, we really have to help that family think about all possible persons. In this particular household, we had a teen mother and we were lucky enough to be doing home visits. The grandmother who is showed holding the baby was not supportive of breastfeeding and in fact used to throw away the express milk that her daughter pumped when her daughter went back to school and she used to give the baby formula. Okay? Now, we were lucky that we were in the home and we had the opportunity to meet the great great grandfather and he was in his 80s and he said if my mama hadn't breastfed me i wouldn't be alive today okay so really pushing your families to identify those people in their family or external to their family who are going to be their go-to people when they get challenges and this really has to be thought out. This is that contingency plan. Who's gonna be there when the going gets tough? Who can I turn to who's gonna help me on my lactation journey? So in closing, this is your call to action. I'd like you to think about how you're gonna change your provision of antenatal human milk and breastfeeding education I'd like you to tell me how you're gonna help parents develop a breastfeeding support team. And I want you to kind of think about why that sense of urgency is critical. Because what we know with the lactation biomarkers is that we really have that first about seven days to really get it right. And then after that, it's gonna be very challenging. And you know, I just had a, a colleague of mine contact me. She was a very well educated woman. She very much had wanted to breastfeed and um, she did not have a good experience. She did deliver at a BFH high hospital. She had many, many childbirth complications. No one assisted her with uh, starting pumping and she didn't end up starting pumping with a high quality hospital grade computer chip until she was about day 10 post birth. And by the time she contacted me, she was two weeks post birth and her milk supply was at 100 mLs per day. And at that point, we talked about options, the difficulty of getting medication in the US the fact that there's not really good data on herbal preparations and what could she do? And, you know, she has been working very, very hard and pumping with computer chip technology around the clock and her milk supply hasn't really budged. It's about 100 to 150 per day. So we need to help families have a proactive approach, a contingency plan, and we need to understand there's a critical window. So at this point, my uh, email address is there and included on the handout. And I believe I left us about five minutes for questions. Thank you, Diane, for that great information. You did leave us about six minutes for questions and answers. So go ahead and put those into the chat function and we will try to get to the ones that are coming in. Um, the first one is, uh, let me get to it quick. Um, this was um, posted in the chat uh, when you were talking about contingency plans for moms and someone commented, why can't BSN or MSN nurses do this? Oh, I think they should. <laughs> <laughs> I 100%, I mean, uh, mm. I have to be careful. 
sometimes in my professional career, I have had people say to me that um, I am anti-lactation consultant. I am not anti-lactation consultant. I think everyone should be able to have a lactation consultant, but the thing is not everyone gets to see a lactation consultant. So I always say I'm pro-nurse, okay? Because for me, the nurse, whether it is the nurse in the hospital or the nurse in the community, that nurse is the person, whether they're a BSM prepared nurse or a master's prepared nurse, who could be a make or break it in that breastfeeding journey. And I have a really interesting paper that was just published this year um, with a nurse practitioner of mine at one of our care network sites. And it was um, a child who had experienced growth failure between his two month, four month, six month visit. The physician wanted the mother to just start formula feeding and the mother didn't want to. And by really like doing a thorough assessment in primary care, this nurse practitioner found out the mom wasn't feeding enough. The baby started sleeping through the night and that like, that's why the baby wasn't gaining. And it was a very easy fix really, but you have to be asking the right questions. And so a hundred percent, please, every nurse should, every nurse should be able to provide evidence-based lactation care and support, and they should be able to identify risk factors to help the family have a contingency plan if breast, breastfeeding doesn't have the ideal support, start at birth. I mean, I would love it if every baby came out with skin to skin and latched on and it was perfect. It's just, that's not how the majority of our families, at least in the U.S., give birth. Thank you. Um, the next question is any suggestions for restarting a support group? I've tried multiple times as an RN IBCLC in a hospital to jumpstart a group, but can't get any attendance. Yes, <laughs> I hear this a lot. And, you know, I think sometimes it's how you frame it. Um, the word support, um, has been associated with negative connotations in some communities, um, or some communities don't believe they need, quote, uh, support. And so maybe thinking about reframing um, what you call the group and how you approach the group. And I'll give the example of GEMS, um, because that's the one that's closest to my heart. They actually have a rotating list of topics that they go through and the group when it meets can morph into any direction that they want, but they have like a group of science based topics. So like week one is about informed decision making and it's come learn the science about human milk. And then the second week is like, how do you get the most robust milk supply? So the, it is support for the family, but they're, they're catching it in like um, education and science. So I think that is one approach that I think is helpful. And I think the other thing is if you can talk to your parents, um, if you could just talk one-on-one -on -one with some families and ask them, what would be good for you? What would work for you? Um, because different families do have different needs and different thoughts about how to best approach things. And I, approach things. And I, I think you know, I, I don't. I think COVID has been bad for childbearing families in general. But I do think one good thing is is that we have had more robust services online and you know we have more people accessing things like the pacify app and stuff and again it's not a replacement for in person but we become a little bit more savvy and technical support thank you for that it looks like we're almost at the top of the hour so a couple quick things before we end today um, registration is open at medilaeducation.com for our 
September 15th webinar. And we also have registration open and there's a link on medillaeducation.com for our um, September 21st and 22nd um, symposium on lactation and breastfeeding. And we're excited to have this. This is the 15th annual um, symposium that we're holding. And this year it's different because it's uh, all virtual. And Diane is actually going to be one of the presenters at this symposium. Um, the fee is 60 euros, which works out to about $70 US, 90 Canadian. And the fee can actually be used. Medela is donating breastfeeding supplies to um, several Ronald McDonald House charities um, throughout the world. And you have the option of allowing your registration fee to be used to help us donate even more supplies um, at the registration um, section of the form. Um, if you have any questions or you want additional information, again, you can visit medillaeducation.com and click on the bar at the top of the page to register and get more information. Or if you have any other um, questions, feel free to reach out to us at education at medilla.com. Uh, Diane, again, thank you so much for presenting today. And thank you for those very nice words um, to honor Dr. Peter Hartman. Um, he will be missed dearly by not only Medilla, but the lactation um, world. Have a good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, everyone.